Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Dr. Psych Mom Show. Today, we're going to be talking about when people say that their only problem in the relationship, the only contribution that they have to the dysfunction, is when they're just too nice. And um, obviously, I put this in quotes, so you understand that I don't think this is reality. Um, But before we get to that, please do subscribe. I have a lot of subscriber episodes. Most recent is, uh, do you have... um, Do you have to think about self-care as a positive or can it also be looked at more objectively such that it, like everything else, can have its downsides, like being selfish? So uh, the the theme in a couple recent episodes are more like can the more passive conflict avoidant partner examine their role in the dysfunction, right? So um, anyway... Uh, so moving on to this one. So sometimes when you talk to people, they they really, they act like they are being really objective and they're doing a lot of soul searching. And they say, you know, I really thought about it. And I think that my problem is I'm just too nice. I care too much. I try to help people to excess and I just put myself last. Well, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I mean, is this a real answer or is this like on a job interview when they ask you what your strengths are and you say all your strengths and they ask you your weaknesses and you say, I'm just too perfectionistic and I give too much to the job. Like, give me a fucking break, right? So the people that say that they're too nice, they fall into two categories. Uh, At an extreme, they're truly covert narcissists, people that act like martyrs and really get off on being like the good one at all times. And again, as I've discussed, it's not like narcissism means that you're a monster or something. It's a defense from your upbringing. It's something, it's a way that you learn to be from modeling after a parent and or from being trained that, um, so it's one of two things when there's any narcissistic traits or the diagnosis itself, it's either because you're literally modeling on a parent or because you were um, trained to have no needs and you were basically abused and neglected and so in reality reaction to that adaptively, um, you cultivated this, you know, this other persona that could save you and be a comfort to you, whether that's that you're openly so great or that you're covertly so great. So the covert narcissism is when people act more like professional victims and they're always the good one. They're always the good one. And there's a lot of black and white thinking and that's, um, you know, indicated by the whole too nice thing. You know, they, they only can think of themselves as good. So what's their problem? Their problem is they're too good, right? And so this can be infuriating to the spouse who's like, you're not that nice, you know? <laughs> like like people will say, you know what my problem is? I'm too nice. And they'll be in couples counseling. And the person's face will be like, here we fucking go again. They'll be rolling their eyes. And they'll be like, you're not. You're not too nice, you know? Like that's not the thing. Maybe you're nice to other people. You're not that nice to me. Um, so what do they really mean by too nice? What does too nice represent as a construct, if interrogated, it really means a a few things, passive, conflict avoidant, codependent. I mean, that's what it means. Because nice, as I've discussed, a lot of guys also say that their problem, they don't get chicks because they're too nice. No, women love nice. Nice meaning pleasant, agreeable, you know, positive. Those are like, that is a dictionary definition of nice. What women don't like is, um, you know, uh, self-effacing to the point of, of discomfort to those around you and just like... It, deferential, obsequious. Yeah, that stuff's a turnoff. But nice, nice is good. So there's no such thing as too nice than being bad. Too nice would just be like I'm this awesome, like super pleasant person that's like positive and affirming and cheerful and just really like a, a super positive person. In the big five uh, traits, you know, that's a personality a way of thinking about personality. There's lots of social psychology research on personality. And uh, the big five is one way. You guys probably know more about the Myers-Briggs with the ENTJ, all that. But the big five personality traits, you could remember in the acronym OCEAN, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Agreeableness does not mean any sort of um, being a doormat. It means literally being like a go-with-the-flow, agreeable, positive person that everybody likes to be around. That is being nice and that is good. 
Too nice, though, what the person means is basically a few things. Um, I let everybody walk all over me, so then basically I can brag about it by saying I'm too nice. Um, or I am a terrified of any sort of conflict so I brush things under the rug until literally either I explode or I just completely detach from those around me and or I am completely codependent so for example my husband's an alcoholic and I'm the one who's buying him alcohol uh just too nice you know and none of these things are good so to those, none of them mean nice. None of them have anything to do with nice. They are a different construct, and it's a totally different ball game. If you show up into couples counseling and you say, my problems are that I'm codependent, I'm enabling, and I'm conflict averse. Well, shit, you don't sound that great then either, you know? And now we can really play ball because the one person is a compulsive, uh, uh, you know, uh, problem person in whatever way. Like they're denoted as the, quote, problem person in the relationship, whether they have addiction, they have depression, they have anxiety, whatever. But you know better because you are enabling their behavior because of terror of conflict, hating to rock the boat, or you literally don't know who, what your identity would be without having people's problems to solve or uh, being a professional victim at an extreme of being a covert narcissist. Narcissist. So this too nice thing needs to be explored if you have any hope of getting an objective look at your relationship and your contribution. I've written a post, divorce is time to a uh, great time to examine your contribution to what went wrong in your marriage, right? And this is like people come into counseling constantly when they're divorcing. This is a great time. Just like I just recorded a podcast about midlife crisis. Um, it, whenever there's something that spurs deeper self reflection because a tremendous event has occurred in your life, such as divorce, midlife, a health crisis, a parenting crisis of some sort. Um, the, these are great times to explore your contribution with the hopes of changing the dynamic. So if you just think of yourself as too nice and then the other person's just a shithead, right, then, then where do you end? I mean, it pretty much ends right there. And a lot of people are drawn to this black and white victim perpetrator rhetoric if they grew up here and get at home. So these are the people, I always use my bank example, you know, where the parent goes to the bank and they come back with a story, a story about David versus Goliath. You know, I went up to the bank teller and I said, can you change these 20s for fives? And you know what she said? She said she couldn't do it. So I said, ha ha, why don't you go to the manager? And she did, and God damn it, I got, they tried to not give me fives, but I got them anyway. Like, you know, this seems normal when you grow up with it, and then you're older, and you're like, holy shit, other people just go to the bank. You know, I mean, no big deal, just went to the bank, you know? And like when everything is, um, you know, set out for you in this good versus evil sort of way from childhood, which is associated with numerous things, parents who struggle with depression, with paranoia, parents who have unresolved trauma, also extremely religious upbringings where literally the stories in, in the Bible are good versus evil. That's literally David versus Goliath, right? So, or or super political homes, like anything where there's a good guy and a bad guy, right? And the, the good versus evil infiltrates all aspects of life, such, such as every small encounter that a parent has, all of their major stories are like when they were the one who stood up to an oppressor, or when somebody oppressed them and they couldn't stand up, but now they will, et cetera, et cetera. So when you grow up hearing stuff like this, then what are you drawn to in your marriage? Which the only type of marriage that makes sense, a victim and a perpetrator. And so it's easier to be the victim because then you're the nice guy, quote unquote. You are the powers of good. So you're going to be drawn to this kind of dynamic and you're not going to really interrogate your own contribution. I had a post years ago. Uh, you could find it. I think it's my husband doesn't notice I'm an alcoholic would be the heading of it. Um, and the woman said, oh, my God, my husband is such a saint to put up with me. He's this wonderful guy. He's so smart. He's so brilliant. He's wonderful. I'm I just do nothing, you know, and uh, he's so good even that he knows I like to drink um, like a bottle of wine every night. And in order to save money, he's making wine now, his own wine. 
or beer or so I was like what in the hell it was such it was a classic example of codependence this man in he loves to be the hero so much he loves to be the good one so much to be put on a pedestal so much as the good one that he's literally ignoring that his wife has an active alcohol problem and instead he's making himself the valiant hero that provides the alcohol at a lower cost to the family and it was just such a classic um uh, dynamic which is why i wrote about it and i think i said something to that effect in my characterization of it this was an anonymous post or anonymous reader but anyway the point is some people are so drawn to the idea of themselves being good and they have to be good at all times that they basically forget to think about whether they are perpetuating the dysfunction of their household and invariably it takes two to tango and marriages are 50 50 and if somebody let's say is this depressed difficult um person that just like lays around on the couch but you're the person who's always running around and fluffing their pillow for them and never being like hey you know guess what you know you're depressed something's wrong i don't know what's wrong but i know you're not supposed to be on the couch all the time we need to get you into treatment what's going on i can't handle this family all by myself i need you you know yeah, I mean, you got to do that. And I talk about that with how men should handle their depressed wives, because a lot of men fall into this um, bucket of saying they're the hero, you know, in this situation, when in reality, they're perpetuating dysfunction by ignoring it, pushing it under the rug, because on some level, they're very comfortable with the rescuing knight in shining armor uh, rhetoric. And the same on the woman's end. There's so many women that put up with a husband who is, you know, just uh, an asshole. You know, he's an asshole. He drinks too much. He lays around, he plays video games, barely engages with the kids. But, you know, uh, that is who she is going to make her cross to bear. Probably saw a mother with a cross to bear of her own father. And so now this martyr thing is super common. So, yeah, she rolls her eyes. She calls him her fourth child or her third child or whatever. Um, But she keeps fluffing the pillows metaphorically and probably literally. And this does not help the man. It doesn't help the kids and what they see for damn sure because they're just going to replicate it as she did, as he did. And it doesn't help anybody. But it's comfortable being in the role of the good one, the nice one, the helpful one, the martyr, you know, the victim. All of these seem better than the bad one, right? But there is no good or bad. You know, there is no good or bad. In family systems therapy, we talk about this all the time, um, that I say we, they, you know, (laughs) family systems theorists, of which I am not a published one, but have read family systems theory. Um, This is like Mnuchin and stuff like that. for my psychology listeners. But anyway, uh, they talk about there being a scapegoat and triangulation. There's never, there is situated a problem person. That person is posited by the family as the problem person. But that just, this person just takes on all the dysfunction of the unit. There's no really a bad person. There may be like, for example, this happens in families if one kid has ADHD, right? So this one becomes the bad one. This is the one that acts out. This is the one that makes problems. All of our house is so stressful because of this one one misbehaves at school if not for this child we would be in a perfect happy family no you wouldn't no you wouldn't and people will uh, of course understand this better because people have more sympathy for children uh this is normal you know but it's the same for adults so just because your husband has adhd doesn't make him like you know a monster right it doesn't make him the problem a lot of the problem also is that you've allowed him to be his worst self possibly in situations that I'm describing where you situate yourself as too nice. So too nice always needs to be interrogated full stop. There is no such thing as that being the only problem. And also frequently too nice goes along with no sex. This is just anecdotal from hundreds of people I work with. You know, frequently too nice is like, well, man, I am just so nice and I do so much stuff around the house because he doesn't help and he doesn't this and he doesn't that. So we haven't had sex in three years. But of course, you can understand because I'm always um, compensating for him. It's like, (laughs) that doesn't make sense. You know, like that does not make sense. That is an extreme um, problem. And there's no uh, happily married person who would be like, listen to the very good logical reason why we haven't had sex in three years. That's not like a thing. Unless the thing is like, we both have zero sexual drive. We don't care. All right. Well and good. Fine. But otherwise, if there's one person that does want to have sex and they have not had sex in, you know, certainly less than three years would be a problem. But three years, definitely 
definitely a problem, then definitely a problem, you know, and it can never really be explained by, and it's just because I'm so busy because I'm living two lives because he basically does nothing, so I have to do everything. What about we deal with that problem, you know, like before three years have elapsed of sexlessness and people often don't want to, and I have a podcast on this when over-functioning is an, is an excuse to avoid intimacy because many men are extremely depressed and many women who have no sex marriages, no touch marriages are extremely depressed because they have no sex and no touch so they're even going to be worse you know and everything is a vicious cycle so if you have ever thought or if your partner tells you that the problem is they're too nice and you're too terrible then this can maybe help you flip the script a little bit and understand it takes two to tango in a dysfunctional marriage and you should get into couples counseling yesterday with the second best time being today Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed this and uh, got something out of it. Please do subscribe. Two more episodes, I'll do a subscriber one. Please do join my Facebook group. And of course, do uh, follow me all over social media like TikTok. I do videos. I do, sometimes I record the podcast, then I'm all hyped up and I go do a video. Then my podcast comes out, you know, in a week or two, but the video came out sooner. So if you were following my social media, then you would get to see my little videos. All right, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye-bye.